who are with us this morning. And I mentioned earlier that if you have any um, joys, any prayer requests, please put those in the comments below. And we would love to be praying with you and talking with you. And for everybody that is joining us here this morning, we are so glad that you are with us. It is hot, but it is beautiful because the sun is out and that is all we need. This morning, I would like to go over the uh, birthdays this week. Today, happy birthday to Floyd Smith, Ed Smith. And I know he is out fishing this morning and having probably the time of his life, but I know he is with us in spirit. So happy birthday to Ed this morning, um, this week, week, today. And then this week, happy birthday to Barb Stockman and Rick Stockman. So happy birthday, you guys. We are going to be collecting our offering here today at the end of the service. So if you have your offering, if you just hold that tight and on your way out um, today when you are dismissed by our ushers, then you can just drop them into the offering plate. And we are so grateful that you are giving to our, our Lord and our church and our community. And those online, if um, you would like to mail in your offering, you can do that. You can go online to our website and utilize PayPal, super easy, and uh, or you can just drop it off whenever uh, that works out for you. But we are so grateful for everybody continuing to, to give to our community, to our church, and to do this act of worship for our Savior. Vacation Bible School is right around the corner, and this is we're down to the final few days for registration. So it's a little different this year. Normally we take people as they come the week of vacation Bible school. And we're not going to turn anybody away. But in order to plan and to have all of our supplies and to keep everybody safe, we want to make sure that everybody is registered in, in advance. So you can come to, you can pick up a, a form outside the office, um, or you can go online. You can go to our website. That link is on the website. To, uh, register, but pass the word. We want to make sure we get all of our kiddos registered. And one of the cool things this year, um, they are going to be getting an awesome t-shirt that says, Work in Progress. Because that's what we are, right guys? We are a work in progress. And God is constantly working in through us to, to give us all that we need as we, we grow in our relationship with Him. So it's going to be a, a great uh, Vacation Bible School this year. Get those Get the word out. Get everybody registered. Um, Tuesday is the last day for registration. All right. This morning, I need to kind of redeem myself a little bit from last week since the eggs didn't work out very well <laughs> right now. God gives us what we need, and I, I am pumped about this one today. Today, we kids, uh, well, first of all, kids, I want to mention, if you did not grab a Bible activity pack, uh, outside the sanctuary, make sure you grab one of those so you have that. It's got a little treat in it and some, some activity pages um, for during our service here. But today, we are going to talk about how God can do the impossible. Do you guys believe that? Do you believe that God can do absolutely impossible things? Amen? Yes, yes, I do. I do. I believe that God is going to help me walk through this piece of paper. Really? So I wonder how many of you are asking yourselves right now, she is absolutely, not asking, telling yourselves right now, she's absolutely nuts, right? Because how is Miss Gretchen, <laughs> ask me things like nuts, <laughs> how is Miss Gretchen going to be able to walk through a piece of paper that is totally impossible? Well, you know, there are things in our lives that do seem impossible, but... The cool thing about it is God is always working and always giving us exactly what we need to make it through life. Now, you know, sometimes we are faced with problems. We're faced with questions that seem totally impossible to get out of, to try to figure things out, right? They worry us. Does anybody ever get worried? I get worried. I'll be quite honest. Even though I try to spend my time with the Lord every day, I still worry. That is one of my big faults. <laughs> I still worry. But I do know that God has things in control. And when I really let go 
and give it to him, he gives me everything that I need. Well, so kiddos, you might be wondering, what are some things that we're talking about? So let's go through some examples, shall we? So some of you have family members that are sick, right? And um, maybe you're wondering how they're going to be able to become well again. Maybe you're wondering how they're going to be able to get around again and do the things that they used to do. And you just don't have any answers. Do you ever sit and think about those things? Worry about your grandparents? Worry about your parents? Yeah? Then maybe with school, right around the corner, how many of you are wondering how school is going to work out this fall? Are you going to have to go to school and sit in a classroom with your mask on all day long? Or are you going to be able to stay home like you were at the end of the last school year and have to do all of your studies online? Was that fun? Kiddos, you know, did you like that? Some of you yes, some of you no. It was, it was tough because you didn't get to see your friends and, you know, imagining sitting there all day with a mask on. I'm not sure that that's really a great answer either. But God gives us what we need. Another example, some kids have family members that are not getting along right now. Or maybe you have a friend you're not getting along with right now. Does that happen? Do you guys ever fight with your friends or with family members and you kind of wonder, how are things going to work out? And you might sit there and you worry and you're bummed because your friend is just not working out right now and you're not sure how it's going to get fixed. Some kids might wonder where their next meal is coming from. That's why, you know, we do things like buddy bags because there's a lot of kids out there that don't have parents to help them with their food or, or the family just doesn't have the money to have the food there for the kids to keep them healthy. So, but some kids worry about that kind of stuff. The Bible tells us that all things are possible with God. In Matthew 19, verse 26, it says, Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen. Amen. It is not good to sit and worry about things. When we try to figure things out on our own, it never works. And we are miserable in the process. Yes. But God gives us the opportunity to have an amazing life with him when we trust him, when we put our trust in him, and when we believe that we can do absolutely anything through his power. He has a plan for each one of us, and he is working all things out for good. And... The impossible things can happen when we just put our faith in him. He performs miracles every single day. Maybe it's the miracle of getting an ice cream cone, right? Maybe it's the miracle of seeing a bird, one of your favorite birds, come land in one of your trees and hear this beautiful song. Maybe it's a huge miracle where they heal cancer or they heal some other sickness. He is constantly doing miracles. It's just whether or not we see them, we can see those impossible things that he's doing. So when we put our whole faith in him, our trust in him, he gives us ways to do the impossible. I told you I was going to step through the paper. That's great. Right?
pray that you help us to set aside everything that is going on this morning, Lord. Let, it, let this just be a time of amazing, joy-filled worship. I just pray, Lord, that our hearts will be open to you, our ears will be open to your word. And Lord, just fill our voices with a beautiful song. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are doing in our life. We ask all of this in your name. If you are able, please stand with us this morning and join us in worship.
joy and we praise to you, Lord. Thank you for being so faithful and thank you for your love. We come to you and we ask this in your name.
Do you know God loves you this morning? So do you know that God loves you this morning? Amen. It is important that we understand that the Lord loves us. I'm, I'm excited that he would love someone like me. And I'm more excited that he would love someone. Yeah, yeah you know what's coming, then. Yeah, yeah. Like you. Amen. Father, we come this morning and we thank you for who you are. We're reminded, Lord, through the songs, that you are more than enough for us. And that you are a great God and you're worthy of all our praise. And we come this morning, Lord, and humble ourselves before you. And just thanking you, Lord, for waking us up this morning. Reminding us that you are there. We love the Lord and the sun came up from the east as it was from the day that you said, let there be light. Lord, I thank you today that we can trust you for every circumstance, situation that we find ourselves going through, that you're there as your Heavenly Father, Lord. I'm reminded, Lord, Brother Alvin said that his sister-in-law is, uh, is in bad health, and the Lord and uh, brother-in-law, excuse me, <coughs> God, they need your help. And I thought about, Lord, how many over the last past year, Lord, um, of his loved ones that went home to be with you. Lord, sometimes life seems to be so heavy, so hard, so difficult. And yet in the midst of it, Lord, you bring joy, comfort, and peace. You're our strength in our times of weakness. And remind us, Lord, that your yoke is easy and your burdens are light. That we're going to find assurance and strength, Lord, that only you can give. And I pray this morning, Lord, that we would allow you to be God in our lives and, and know that we can trust you, Lord. Help us to love as you have loved us. Help us, Lord, to, to trust you, dear Heavenly Father. And Lord, and recognize, Lord, that with you all things are possible. And, and so, Lord, let us bring our impossibilities before a great God who is able to do exceedingly above all that we've asked and hoped. Lord, we pray, Lord, for this nation, Lord. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that we would as the body of Christ is gathering, Lord, through from east to west, north to south, that, Lord, that we would be mindful, Lord, that November will not be the answer to what we need. You're the answer for what we need. Let us pray for those, Lord, that are running for offices, Lord. Let us pray, Lord, that they would humble themselves, Lord, before a mighty God. For, Lord, it's in that that wisdom comes, Lord, with understanding. It's with that, Lord, that we would have, Lord, an idea, Lord, of what people need. Because we'd be looking through the lens of your love. Lord, we pray, Lord, for those, Lord, that are being attacked, Lord, through health and sickness, Lord. Those that are in the nursing homes right now, Lord, in extended care, Lord. And those to Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift up Christine Bullock, Lord, who fell. Lord, and has surgery yesterday, Lord, and, and has come through it, and we just thank you for it, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you just be with her, hold her, and keep her, and be with her family. And we thank you, Lord, for faithful friends like Judy. And Lord, and that's what you called us to be, a friend to one another, to love as you have loved us. And so we pray, Lord, not only for us this morning, Lord, we pray, Lord, for the body of Christ around the world. That, Lord, during this time of the virus, Lord, May we fix our eyes on you. May we begin to pray, Lord. And as we prayed last week, as the saints begin to pray, Lord, that this virus be removed, Lord. When it is suddenly gone, let them know, dear Heavenly Father, that there was nothing magical that happened. There was nothing that, 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 that they had done that changed it. But the power of prayer, Lord, is able to change everything. And so, Lord, let us pray without ceasing. Let us believe, dear Heavenly Father, that, Lord, there's power in him. And so we come, and now we ask, Lord, you to have your way, to guide us and direct us, Lord, keep us, be our strength, and glorify yourself today in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord praise. Amen. 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 We thank God for you to come and you see it. We thank God this morning for our brothers and sisters that are online that are, are with us and we just thank you right now that I, I had a, a great opportunity this morning to, to meet some people that had come to us. And I, I asked them, uh, uh, first time have you been here at First Baptist? And they said, yes. And they looked at me and they said, 
we've been following you online, and, and that's why we're here. And I thank God today that the Lord is doing those things. He's reaching out and letting us know that there are those that are seeking and that we need to be faithful in the call that he has placed upon our lives and that we need to let the light so shine that others might see what the good works that God is doing in us. So this morning, we just thank God for each and every one of you that are here for the first time. We thank God for the young man that says, I know you, I cut your grass, and we're just glad to have you here this morning. Amen. 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 And so God works in mysterious ways. I didn't know that he speaks to the heart while we're cutting grass. Amen. I didn't say smoking grass. I said cutting grass. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure that everyone heard me clearly. Amen. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the word. We're going to be talking about where to live life in Christ. Something about Colossians has been very important to us. I know i got to get rid of the gum. But it's not far. And so what we want to look at is this. What is God calling us as the church to do? He's wanting us to know him. He is wanting us to embrace him. He is wanting us to be like him. See, I, I, I want us to know this morning that that is God's plan for our lives. That we would be like him. Is that possible? Is that possible for people such as myself or, or people like you? Can we be like God? Can we be what Jesus has been before us? Can we be that light in the midst of darkness? Well, the Word of God says we can. And so for those of you that can stand, would you stand for the reading of the Word? And I would ask that we would read the Word together. From Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. Let us read. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Hearing that no one, not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is the all and in all. And so, Father, we thank you right now as we look at your word. Open our understanding. Give us ears to hear and our heart to receive in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue here with Colossians, we've, we've been talking about last week about put off the old man and put on the, the new man. And now we talked about living a life right in Christ. But today it begins to tell us that it's more than just a, a living a life right in Christ. It's like are we, we are to live life in Christ. It's not just living it right, but we're to live it in Him. Because, see, I don't know about you, but I have tried to live right according to the Word of God. I've tried to do right according to the Word of God. But I've found out that many times in those situations, it was me trying to do better. I knew I needed to do better. Didn't you know you needed to do better? And so we tried to do that. But the Word really speaks different than that. It talks about that we have Christ in our lives. And so we read that, but seeing that you have put off the old self with this practice. <coughs> hmm. And then I began to check off the things I had put off and the things I kept on. And I found that if I had put it in a closet, I had more things that I had, less things that I had put on than the things that I had put off. Now sometimes the put off is like this. Do you have a closet that you got clothes that you haven't worn in many years because you still think that I'm going to lose that weight and I'm going to be able to wear them again? We, we have those ideas and, and thoughts, but the truth of it is we need to just get rid of that. And then wear what we got and wear it totally. And then if we have to buy other clothes because we lost more, doing more, then we tell everybody, go are not looking at but when you're not walking and begin to share with them that this is what I've been doing. And as the word of God tells us when we put off the old man, that it says, don't hold on to it. Don't, don't cling to it, but, but let it go. And so what we're talking about is in Christ, that we are to live a life in Christ. That we need to put all the newness of God in our heart and in our lives. And, 
and that we need to walk with him in strength. And so it read, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And we can understand that. And we say that, what, that when you receive Christ, everyone has Christ in him. And yet I believe that we have not hung on to what that scripture is really speaking to our lives. And so we're going to talk about those things today. Last week we looked at living a life right in Christ. It talked about that if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things of the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is, who is, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. It tells us that we need to die to self. And then we said that we, that's all right. But I know some people who are, who are skittish when it comes to needles. And, and then they became diabetic and they had to stick themselves. And for some it was like this. <laughs> they knew that if they did it, it would be better for them. But the idea of sticking themselves just was difficult for them to do because why? They don't like needles. And so when God tells us that we ought to put off, that we need to die to self, we find it difficult for us to do that because why? There's some things that we have that we do in this life that we really like. And we know that it's borderline concerning the things of God. And then yet in ourselves, we keep trying to say to ourselves, Lord, I'm not as bad as I used to be. And so what we're saying to God is that I, I know you want me to die, but Lord, I'm not as bad as... I look at someone else, yeah. <laughs> I'm not as bad as me. Lord, I'm, I'm, and that's what you can say this morning. I've been bad in my life, but I've never been as bad as pastor. You can say that, that's okay. Because I've been telling you that from the day I got here, and I'm the chief of sinners. Paul said he was, but I outdid him. But God saved my life, and I thank him for that. And so what we're talking about here is that the word of God tells us as believers in Christ, that we need to put to death, therefore, the earthly things that are in us. That we set our minds on things above. The best Christian living comes from minds that are what? Fixed on heaven. We must realize that our lives are now hidden with Christ. And that since Jesus is enthroned in heaven, God is our strength. God is our life. And then should not our thoughts and our hearts be connected to heaven. See, I, I always thought that sometimes as a believer, that if we really try to live this Christian life, we would just come across as goody goody tissues and, and that we think we're something and stuff. But really, what the Word of God is saying, when we recognize that we have Christ in our life, that what that does for each and every one of us, it changes us completely. So let's just say now that in the changing of your life, you've been that person that has been. Uh, Julie says, a person who's been a little fluffy in life, you know? But now you've been walking and you've been doing and you've been eating right and doing all the things that you know that, that it causes good health. It may not taste as good, but you're, you're looking better and all of a sudden, you're in things that you never wore before. You may be smaller than you've ever been. You're not carrying the load that you've been uh, carrying. Your knees feel better. Your feet feel better. You, you have mobility and flexibility. All of those things there. And that's what happens to us when we strip ourselves of the sin. Sin is heavy. Sin wears us out. Now I'm just being honest with you. If you're caught up in sin, it wears you out. Because, see, you're still trying to cover up. You're still trying to, to justify this here. And you make excuses for the behavior. But you know that it is something I need to get rid of. But can we get rid of it? But the word today is saying that it can be done because of what Christ has done for each and every one of us. That in Christ in our life, we have the empowerment of him to be able to shake off those things that have trapped.
tripped us up, the things that keep us down. But it's just that we have to begin to fix our minds on things above, on the heavenly things. And then let our hearts be entirely engrossed by them, the things of God. That we begin to read the word and say, that is me. Have you ever, I don't know, maybe it's, I'm hungry. But have you ever thought about certain foods that you hadn't tried, but once you tried it, you realized how good it was? And the next thing you know, that becomes your favorite meal. Have you ever had a favorite meal? And you can't, it's never a time that that meal won't work for you. Yet you just want it all the time. That it's all right. I'm a breakfast person. I can eat it morning, noon, and night. It doesn't matter. I like breakfast. And so if you have that desire, you have that, that thing that you want, and you want it all the time, God is saying that's what we should desire of Him. We should want Him all the time because nothing has ever made our life greater or better than having Jesus in our life. Amen? Amen. Nothing has touched our life as Jesus has touched our lives. And so the Word of God says, should we not desire it, should we not seek it? As believers, we seek the things that are above. In order to seek these things, our minds must be set on them. And that's what the Word does for us. The Word begins to set our minds on the things of the Lord. So are you in your Word? Are you spending time? I don't care how you get it. You can have it on your phone. You can have it whatever. You don't even have to read it. You can listen to it. Whatever it is. But are you in the Word? And then are you in the Word and understanding that when I get this Word inside of me, it allows me to be able to do what I could not do it myself. All of a sudden, I find myself not carrying the heavy loads of life, but I find myself trimming down into the person that God would have me to be. We're going to get to why this is so important. As Paul continues to talk to the church of Colossae, that he's reminding them that there's things out in the world that will trip them up, but he says your focus has to be on Jesus. And that we seek those things that are above. And they, we set our minds on the things that are concerning him. Loving heavenly things, study them. Let your heart be entirely engrossed by them. We ought to have this hunger, that word of God to speak something to us that we were only going to read that one chapter, but it became alive in us, and now we're on the second chapter, now we're on the third chapter. And all of a sudden we found ourselves reading through one of the letters or, or halfway through one of the books of the Old Testament, and you're saying to yourself, I can't get enough of this. And then you find yourself after you've read it, you go back and you read it again because why? Is it really this way that I can't overcome the things that have tripped me up so much in my own life? Can I truly trust God to give me a life that only he can give me? Can I trust and believe in God? And so the word of God reminds us that we need to trust him, that we need to get engrossed in the things of the Lord. We ought to be like a child who's watching one of their favorite things or playing one of their favorite games and you're trying to talk to them. And you're talking, they have not nodded, yet you even in the room, they have not made, no, I'm not even going to blame it on kids, because why, I know some people who get busy on the, on the things, and, and then they get engrossed on things, now husbands, don't be pointing at your wives, okay, because next week, we're going to be talking about you. What I'm saying is that in these things, God says we ought to get engrossed in him, that we ought to want him, that we need to desire him, and that we should not get to a place that we can't get enough. You remember the commercial that used to say you just can't eat one? You know, well, I've been like that with kitchen cooked potato chips. But I work at it. I take a handful and I put the bag back up, in the, up into the cupboard. And then I sit there, and I go back, and I get some more, and then I put it back in the cupboard. And before that hour is over, with the bag is empty, and I've made 15 trips to the cupboard. <laughs> See, I don't feel so bad making it because I only ate it a handful at a time. But I found myself that I couldn't get enough of it until it was gone. That's how we ought to be with the things of God. That we should desire so much that we could, can't get enough. And the good thing about God is that it's always there. You never eat it all up. There is always plenty. Because with God, it is endless. And that we can have him and, and walk with him and, and live this life in him. 
But we have to desire it. We have to seek after it. We have to want what God has in store for us. And so we live our life with our eyes fixed on heaven, on the things that are above. Earthly things are not all evil. I shared that last week. But some of them are. Even things harmless in themselves become harmful if permitted to take the place that should be reserved for the things of God. Yeah. I'm not big on games and those things there. I, I like solitaire. It's a simple game. Learned it as a child. Now I can do it on my phone. But sometimes I, I find myself, oh, I'm going to tell myself, okay, I'm in the office and the door is shut. <laughs> I know I should have been working on the message. <laughs> but with that game, you can take it, and you know you almost got it. And so what you do, you reset it. You start it over again because you know that this time you can do it. And then after about the fifth or sixth time, you realize you can't do this here. So then you go to the next game. And since you haven't won anything in a while, you don't want to quit as a loser. You want to stay at it till you are a winner. <laughs> and then after that, only 15 minutes or so went by. Okay, it was about an hour and a half. Now. Okay. Right. She said, Pastor, are you doing okay? And I said, I'm fine. But really, I wasn't because I hadn't won anything. <laughs> what I'm saying is there's things that distract us. They're not the worst things in the world, but they keep us from doing what God has called us to do. And so where I should have been preparing for Wednesday night or pre preparing for the day or preparing myself for the things that, that people were coming in to me that I was going to sit down and talk with, I got caught up. And so what it says is that some of the things that are in this world are not the worst things in the world, but they distract us from the things of God. They keep us tied up and they keep us, and keep us from doing what God has called us to do as his children. Because, see, God has put us here that our minds will be, what? Fixed on things above and not on the things of the earth. Not that the things are harmful, not that they're that bad and worst things of the world, but when they start taking us away from what God has in store for us. And so I'll read this to you again. Everything, earthly things are not all evil, but some of them are. Even things harmless to themselves become harmful if permitted to take the place that should be reserved for the things above. And sometimes I, I understand in this life what when I see people that are struggling out there in the world, I should not expect them to, to be what God has called them to be because they don't know, know Jesus. And sometimes I have come up with this saying, and you may have said it too, when I see them struggling in their lives, I, I'm not against them or anything like that because I remember I was once like them, and they're just doing with what? They're doing what sinners do. You know? That's what they do. They're doing exactly what they ought to be doing. And they sin, and I get it. But then the flip side of this is that as a believer in Christ, Christians ought to be doing what Christians do. What Christians do. So we recognize that the world does what the world does, but as believers in Christ, we ought to be as Christians doing what Christians do. And what do Christians really do? What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to follow the things of the Lord. They should put their minds on things above and not on the things of the earth. They should be seeking out to build up a relationship that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. We should be doing exactly what? Living a life that brings God glory and honor. That's what we ought to be doing as believers in Christ. We ought to live life in Jesus. That's what Christians do. We live a life in Him. I mean, Paul was basing the scripture upon what? Practical living. And he's given us instructions on how to live this life in Christ. And so we talked about it. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then if you are raised with Christ, Paul here begins in that section to focus on what? Practical Christian living. See, so what we said is that we get saved, but no one told us that we're to live this life in him 24-7, 365 days a year. I thought it was that we go to 
church. I thought we go to church on Sundays, and, and if you're real spiritual, you go to Bible study. And if you're real spiritual, you're really and really really spiritual, you go to the men's group, and, and you go to, to other places where you can get the Word of God. And so we find ourselves getting busy with things, but that's not what the Word of God says. That when we are engrossed in the things of God that we're doing, what Christians would do, then we says that we live for Him day in, day out. That everything that we do is about the kingdom of God. That means that God is wanting us to give him our all. Everything that is in us, he's wanting us to give him our all. No one told me that God wanted to, us to give him our all. What would it have been like had we come forward when we gave our lives to the Lord? And they began to us and said, oh, so glad to have you here, brother and sister. What is it? I realized that I don't have Christ in my life and I want to know him as my Savior. And we began to clap and praise because why? This individual is receiving Christ as their Savior. Forgive them of sin. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so we're excited. We clap we applaud to them because why? They said that they recognize that they're a sinner and they need Jesus in their life. And we get excited. But what if it had been that they came forward and they said, I want to give my life to Jesus because he gave his life for me. And we begin to say to them, this is what this is all about. You're no longer, no longer your own. You've been bought by Christ. You're to live your life day in, day out, 24-7, learning about the things of God, spending time in His Word, applying God's principles to your life that you may begin to know Him in a greater way. And then when you come short, you need to know that God is just and faithful to forgive you of unrighteousness, but then you get up, and then you continue to run after the things of God. And you're going to be tested by things of the world. You're going to be tested by the old things that were in your life, but you're a new creation in Christ. And so what you need to focus on is that you live every day of your life for Jesus. Amen. The old things have gone away and you become new in Christ Jesus and you're supposed to live like this. Amen. So now you're, do you really want to let Christ be the, the Lord of your life? Do you want him to be your everything? Yes. So if that here is then all the fussing and cussing and this and that and all of those things, you get rid of all those things and, and you begin to live your life for Christ. I believe that they would have said that to many of us. We would have went back to our seats and said, I need to rethink this over. Because the, some of the things you're talking about are things I like to do. But Jesus is calling us to be completely his. He wants us to know him in such a way. And what he wants us to know in him that we can put on the new man and be stripped of the old man of his sinful nature and all of his wicked deeds and begin to put on this new man that is in Christ Jesus that we could do now that we hated doing. That's why we came to Christ because where we were at in our life, we hated it. And we wanted to change. And maybe you were one of those children that was raised in church. And you knew that Jesus was the way and the truth and the life. And, and you gave your heart to Christ because why? This is what we do. But then, again, no one said to us, even though we went to the children's ministries and all of those things and BYPU and everything else that was before us, no one told us that we really had to put Jesus on. That we had to look like him, act like him, smell like him, talk like him. Everything needed to be about him. It might have been different. It might have been different. Now, we don't have any problem being a Cub fan, a Cardinal fan, and whatever it is. We'll wear that stuff all day long, 24-7, 365 times a year. And, and then we can find ourselves even, what, putting the stickers on our car, on our house, putting something out there. And don't let them be playing for a championship. Everybody in the world will know who you're rooting for. Does anyone know that you're rooting for Jesus? Do they know that you're putting Christ first place in your life? And that's what Paul was saying to them. He was saying to them and saying to us, have you truly made it a choice in your life? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And I'm going to give
forgive him everything that is in us. The reason I'm saying all of these things is because I believe as a church, and I'm talking about me now, I'm not talking about you. I believe as a church, I'm part of the church, that my focus is not completely always on the things of the Lord. And when I say that, I'm just saying there's times in my life that I remember that everything was about Jesus. I couldn't remember a time that I wasn't spending some time in God's Word. Now understand, I, I, I'm in it every day. <clears throat> but I was in it before. Because it was like kitchen cook potato chips. I just couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough of what God was speaking to my heart and, and to my life. And what I saw was that when I was there, when I'm doing those things there, life is so much better. And I'm not talking better because everything is going right. I'm talking about my attitude, how I live, the things I say, and, and how I act, and, and how I treat my neighbor. And so when we're looking at the scripture, that's what Paul was dealing with. Paul was dealing with them that you've learned and you're in the word and God has changed your life. But there's more to this Christian walk than, than what you have seen. And I thank God that you're embracing it, that you're doing it. But then he goes on to say that you need to put it to death. And therefore, put to death your members. Therefore, points back to our identification that we are risen with the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God, which is mentioned in Colossians 3, 1 through 4 that we just read. And it is because we understand this fact that we can put to death the things of, in our lives that are contrary to our identity in Jesus Christ. Many years ago, I started wearing t-shirts and on those t-shirts it had this here on it. And when I got the t-shirts in, in the ministry of Jesus Outreach that we were out on the streets, we were sharing the word with people, we were having praise, we, we couldn't say, we couldn't, we, we didn't know what we were doing, we just loved the Lord and we would be out there and when we would be out there on the square, there would be people honking the horn and stuff. And some of them were honking the horn because they were looking at us and going, I used to drink with him. I used to do this with him. I, I used to do this. And this that so-and-so, this and that and the other. And I looked at those guys. They said, they must be pointing at you. <laughs> what I was seeing was that I was being challenged. Are you really going to be about the face of Jesus? And so every time that we were out there, I had the Jesus shirt on. And then every time that I ran into a friend who wanted one of the shirts, so I gave it to him. And they were nice t-shirts and those things there and stuff. And I worked at Caterpillar. I'm in the trays. I, I get oily. I get dirty. I do all of those things there and stuff. And I didn't want to get those shirts all messed up. So I never wore them to work. And that day, I walked into a friend that wanted one of those shirts. He had it on. And he said, where's your shirt? I says, well... I wear my own ministry and those things there. And he looked around and he says, where's your ministry at? And I realized what he was saying. From that day on, I wore the shirts. But one of the things that he said to me was this. Brother, you're either going to be about the things of the Lord and you'll be able to wear that shirt forever. But if you're not, they will make sure you never put that shirt on again. For the next 25 years or so, I was able to wear that shirt till I retired. Well, not the same shirt, but shirts. <laughs> so, so what we find that in that, we're going to be challenged in our Christian walk. That we're going to be challenged and we're going to find things that are going to come at us day in and day out. But if you're decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, then should we not then fix our heart and our mind completely on the things of the Lord? Put to death those identities that don't represent the kingdom of God. And so this morning as we were looking at the word, it talked about that there's, how we put off the old man and we put on the new man with his practice. And that we live for him and we glorify him. When we put on the new man, Paul's phrase was commonly used, and he used it a lot in your scriptures when you read his letters, that he's telling us to put on the new person. And we can also picture a person stripping off the old, sinful nature and all of his wicked deeds, and then beginning to put on the new man in Jesus Christ. 
And when that begins to happen, don't you recognize the difference? We weren't getting along many years ago, and uh, um, I was a mess. We were in church, but I was a mess. And uh, she got tired of it. And uh, I remember uh, that time the Lord speaking to my heart. I'm in Bible studies, and I, I'm in Bible studies, and. And uh, one evening I was in a, a Bible study and God was just moving mightily and stuff and, and the time was ticking by and I had opportunities to, to just listen and, and share with and those things there. And when I got home it was about an hour and a half later than what the Bible study completed and, and she looked at me and she says, you know, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. You're supposed to be doing this and you're still doing the same old things you're doing. And she said that to me because why? I was late again. And so she figured I was still doing something that I've always done. But this time I was doing the things of the Lord. And I looked at her. And I said to her, I was talking to others and we were all talking about the good things of the Lord. And time just got by. And then I said, Anita, I'm not lying. I'm not lying. And this is what this lie looks like when we talk about the old man. My mother used to say to me, I need you to be home by such and such a time. And I've been stayed out a little later, and I know I was late. And my uncle and aunt and family lived on the corner house. So I would run in there, and they said, Money, what are you doing? I said, I just want to stop in and see how everybody was doing. They said, well, everybody's fine. Well, I just wanted to say hi, everybody. And then I went up, and we lived only half a block up, and then I walked into the house. Mom said, where are you at? I says, I've been down to Uncle Kenny and at the horses. <laughs> I didn't lie. I just left there. But that another hour or so, I was somewhere else where she told me, stop playing, get home. See, that was my nature. And so I said to her, I'm not lying. I never didn't tell her the truth. I just didn't give her the whole truth. Man, this was said that we need to put those things off. We need to, to stop doing those things because why? Sometimes we think that we're doing okay, but it's hindering us in our walk with the Lord. And so he tells us that we ought to, to strip those things off and, and become that new person in Christ. And as a new man, for you have stripped off the old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. And now that first we may look like a baby or a child getting dressed. Have you had your little one just ever trying to, to dress themselves? Oh, I can do it. You know, and the buttons are button wrong and, and, and everything and the shirt is sloppy and, and this and that and the other. And, and mom, you can't let them go out that way. So you, you do this here. To, well, that's Christians. We may look a little messy when we first start to surrender everything unto God. But if we continue to do this, he was renewed in the knowledge of God because he's a new man He's renewed in the knowledge. And if he's hungry to know what God says in his word, and it says this in another translation in verse 10, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. So that change is an instant, but it says that we become more like him as we continue to take off and put on, take off and put on, take off and put on. Now I'm not saying that you're putting back on the same thing, you're just taking the same thing off. So I'm saying that you're growing because while you're getting dressed in the things of God, you're putting on that new person. And that's what God is calling us to. The reason I'm saying those things is because I spent, I worked on, I'm sorry. I guess we should have did this for Father's Day. Man, we've learned that pretty well, haven't we? I'm sorry, I was mistaken. I was wrong. And you're right again. Yeah. But one day she said, I'm tired of your sorries. I'm tired of your sorries. Have you ever been tired of sorries? I know that God was tired of my sorries. And he said, when are you going to do it different? When you're going to do it better, when you're going to be more like me, I'm still getting dressed. 
and still be renewed in the understanding of the things of God, and so are you. And then it says to us that in those scriptures that we read today, it's about that it was about the here then there is not Greek or Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, save free, but Christ is all and in all. And when he was talking about those things, it's about the time in which they were living in. The Greek worshiped many gods. The Jewish worshiped one God. But now they are one in Christ. The Jewish people took great pride in their circumcision. And we talked about circumcision that God is talking about as what? The circumcision of the heart. And it says that the circumcision for them symbolizes their, their place as the chosen people of the covenant of God. And that's where they're at today. They're... They, they understand that they're the chosen people, but they're still trying to live something that they can't live. It's called the law. They need a savior. And so it goes on to say, so then because of that, that the Jewish people took great pride in their circumcision and the symbol that they were the chosen people of God. And, and out of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation of Israel came forth. And God had a plan, and the plan was that out of that God of that nation, he would bring forth a savior that would save not only the Jewish nation, but save everyone that he had created. And, and so it goes on to say to us that he separated them from all others, but now we are one in Christ. Because Peter and, and them were Jewish, and but now they're one in Christ. They spoke to Cornelius, they've done all those things, they shared, they went into all of the world in a Christian girl, the gospel. And then it talked about barbarians referred to the non-Greek, they were foreigners. And then it says in the Scythians, they lived in the region of, of the Black Sea, and, and it says that they epitomized the unrefrained refrained person. They were not, you know, you really wouldn't want to take them anywhere. They were that type of person. You know, you would be embarrassed to have them with you. They were, they were that kind of person. And it says in the Bible that, that they were unrefrained uh, and that they were savage, but Christ united both the slave and the free. And they were common divisions of, in the world in Paul's day. And it says, in fact, many Christians were slaves, and we read about that in, in the letters that Paul wrote, wrote, but in Christ we are one. And there are no divisions, nor may there be any divisions in our lives. And that we should not allow those things to rise in us. Now, to say all of those things for this reason, it's because we live in a day today where the church is still divided. We're divided in our different denominations and we're divided in our, our ethnic groups. We're divided in this thing. We're divided in that way. We're the church of God. Why are we talking about these things today? Because the word of God is saying we put those things on. And so it should be evident to everyone that the body of Christ looks like the body of Christ everywhere. Everywhere. But we find now that, that we're disturbed, that we're fighting amongst each other. We're fighting amongst each other because of the color of our skin. We're, we're fighting against each other. In fact, when Americans came to, they weren't Americans then, but when they came here to America, guess who the savages were? The people who were already here before them. They were doing exactly what they'd always done. They weren't savages. They, they were good people. They worked hard. They took care of their land. But these educated people who were Christians persecuted them. Brought slaves over to America, chained them, and then they did these things here. They showed themselves that in the sense that we are Christians and so blacks in America who have been slaves became part of the church, the Methodist church. But what they had to do then eventually was create a group of their own because they couldn't mingle with the other. Here the word of God said that ought not to be. And they were talking this 2,000 years ago and it goes on yet today. If there's a problem in this world today, the problem is with us because we have not put on Christ Jesus. 
We want things to be changed in, in the world, and yet we have not changed. We still look at each other and we think that we're better than or, or this and that, and we're so proud of that I have never done the things you have done, Pastor. No, you haven't. Thank God you haven't. <clears throat> but then in all the time that I've known you, I've never seen Christ in you. So are you better? I understand I'm a wreck. That Christ has changed my life. I understand that you're a wreck, but God has changed your life. And we're still what? Being renewed daily in him. But Christ has to become our everything. And because if he's our everything, then we begin to live in a manner that brings him glory and brings him honor. And so Paul goes on in chapter 3. And he says this in verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive one another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And then let the peace of Christ rule your hearts, to which indeed will you were called in one body and be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your heart to God. And whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give thanks to God, the Father, through him. He's been going through this chapter, verse after verse. And all these things were about that we would begin to recognize who we are in Christ Jesus. Because he said, if we're going to impact the world as Jesus has told us, to go into all the world and, and make disciples, teaching them and instructing them in the things I have instructed you. Why is he now, 60 years later, writing and saying to them, don't forget that we are to, to love one another, and be compassionate, and, and have a good heart, and, and show kindness, and humility, and, and meekness, and patience. He was saying that to them, not because they weren't doing it, but he was saying that you continue to reach out into the body and bring people into the faith of the Lord. They need to see this being demonstrated in the things that you're doing so that they begin to understand that God truly is real. But if you and I don't begin to put on Jesus, who then is Christ real to? Is it just real to your thought and your idea? Or are we applying the things of God that others might see his good works in our lives? The hardest thing and the most difficult thing as believers in Christ is that God is saying to us, we have to look more like him day in, day out. And it's not that we're perfect and not that we get everything right. It's not that we do everything the way God would have us to do. But his message to us is that our love ought to be first right here with one another. So that when anyone comes into the body of Christ, they will be able to what? Embrace everything that God has called us to embrace. That we ought to do everything according to his will. That somebody might see what his good works operating in our life. That we would be a light to some that are in darkness and they would say, I think there's something about this Jesus because I've been observing you from a distance. And I'm thinking, I want to be like that person. You never know who's watching. You never know who's, who's spotting you or, or, or looking to see if you're looking like what you're wearing. They know we go to church, but are we, are we looking like him? Are we turning to be more like Jesus in our coming and in our going? See, it's in those things there that the body of Christ grows. It's in those places there that our family begins to understand that Jesus Christ is our everything. 
It's when we begin to do these things. And Paul was sharing with the church of Colossae and he's sharing with the church today that we begin to put off and put on Jesus. And then we begin to demonstrate it that our life is, a, is new in Christ Jesus and we're to live life in Christ and we're to become more like him day in and day out. And we begin to do those things according to his perfect will. According to the image of him who created us is how we ought to look and how we ought to live. In Genesis 1, 27, it talks about that. It's where it says that God created Adam in his own image. And nevertheless, now that the first Adam is regarded as the old man, you know, see, Adam sinned and, and we took on the sin of Adam in our lives. It separated us from God. And that's why it was difficult, and that's why God had to bring forth a people of his own so that he could bring forth his son to die for us, that we might live in him. And it says, in the old man we put off and, and we discard, but cause now we are created after the image of the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ. We're to look more like Jesus every day. Did you not look in the mirror at times in your life now that you have grown older and you have seen your mother and your father? You look in there and go, oh, my, oh, 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 oh. But if we're starting to look in the mirror and see Jesus, you would go, oh, oh man, I'm looking at that. And what has happened? All the fluff is starting to drop off. And I'm starting to get more and more like him. I find myself being able to run the race harder and longer and straighter than I've ever been able to run it before. I've been able to love beyond my own ability. I've been merciful and gracious to others because why God has been merciful and gracious to me. I've been an encourager to others because why God has always been, been there to encourage me and put people in my path to encourage me. And so he says to us that he is, we become like him, the second Adam. And we began to look more like him. And all the barriers that existed that they talked about in ancient Rome that, that are also in the world today. And the power of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ broke all of them down. Over the past few months, we've been hearing about all of the things that are going on in this country. And I'm just going to say this. It's not about flags or statues. It's not about any of those things. None of those things are going to cause a harmony in the heart of man. Because why? If man is separated from the things of God, then their heart is wicked. And if we're the body of Christ, we should begin to say that Christ is the only answer for healing in America, healing in the world. But we can't stand out and say that if we are what? Operating in our blood. And not looking more like Jesus. If there's division among ourselves, how do we think that we can bring peace to a world and in introducing the world to Jesus Christ when we don't understand that Jesus Christ is everything for our lives day in, day out? So he's telling me that if I want my life better, then I'm going to have to embrace him even more. I'm going to have to apply him to my life day in and day out if I'm going to walk with him and make a difference and impact not only my family and my children and my children's children, but if I'm going to impact my neighbors or even make a difference in your life, I'm going to have to be more like Jesus. And it's in that development, in that change, that revival happens. It's in that attitude and thought is where people get up on Sunday morning and they say, I'm going to church. And they're going to church because why they're saying it's where the Lord is at. Because why my brothers and sisters have the Lord in them. And so the barriers existed in ancient Rome. And the power of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ broke them all down. Especially powerful was the barriers of how a man looked at one another. Christianity is the only thing that can change that, or how we look at one another. How we're able to get past those things. Because why? Demonstrations 
will not change anything. Christ is the only thing that can change the heart of man. And until we, the church, embrace that, don't expect anything to change. One so at a time will change, but everybody won't change until Christ impacts their life. When he becomes that real to you and I, change will begin to happen. We'll believe that God is able to do and we'll pray believing. We'll study to show ourselves and prove. Now as Christians once walked in those sins that we talked about as we've been studying Colossians chapter 3, it is possible and it's tragic that these sins that we've talked about these past weeks These sins, we find ourselves, ourselves still occasionally walking in them. And they mark our Christian life because we feel ashamed. We know that's not where God would have us. It's the place where we know that he's wanting and calling more in us. And that God has called us to walk in a manner that is living in him. This work of the new Christian and this new work of the new creation not only deals with the old man, but it gives us a new man patterned after Jesus Christ. We are to live this life in a way that brings God glory and it brings him honor. Amen. 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 I have to get there. I have to get there. It doesn't matter if you can quote it all, say it, speak it, teach it. If you're not living it, you're missing out on the greatest adventure of your life. It's because when we give Jesus our everything, everything changes. Everything changes. Change doesn't come just by praying. Change comes by applying what God has called us to. And we need to know that today for our lives. As the worship team is coming, I'm just going to ask you today to say and ask yourself, am I ready to give him everything? He's been building us up to this place to tell us that we are to live in Christ. That's where we're at. And that's where God has called us to. And so this morning, as you're watching and listening to us on the screens, and maybe you're sitting there at home and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, you need to know today that his arms are reaching out to you. And if you're here this morning and you know that Christ is speaking to you, I ask that you would come and, and meet us after church and we will talk with you about the things of God. Call us if God is making an impact and a difference in your life, and we will be there for you.
Yes, Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, you are our living hope. And so, Lord, we thank you now for who you are. And I thank you, Lord, that you are explaining through your word who we are in you. Lord, I pray that we will find, Lord, that we will grow and grow in our relationship with you. We'll no longer dress like babes or children, but we will dress as those who've been covered in the blood of the Lamb of God. We thank you for this great salvation. We thank you for the transformation that you have given and the call you have placed upon we, your church. And Lord, and as we grow in you in the likeness of your glory, that our lives, Lord, will represent, Lord, you, for you are all those things, me, humble, loving, caring, merciful. You are great and mighty. And Lord, you have called us to live and look like you. Help us, Lord, that we might grow and grow and grow. That in this hour in which we live in, the world will see the church as the church. And we give you all the praise, give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Let every heart say amen. 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 Let's give the Lord praise. Amen. Amen. We thank God today for each and every one of you. We thank the Lord that us as well uh, uh, will lead you out. And so please put your mask on, do all of those things we're supposed to.